Hi, Planet Wayne here, and welcome to my uh, next video uh, based on the Attack of the BT mod pack. Um, you've probably already been following the um, adventures of Pungence and Corrales in the uh, build off that they've got going on with their various gun shops and shooting alleys and so on. Um, and I actually thought, looking at the uh, alleys that they got constructed, um, that we might be able to do something with um, programming logic on the uh, programmable Redneck controller to actually um, get score counts and various other bits and pieces going on. Um, so the purpose of today's video is just to show you how to create um, a single lane, um, and they're constructed in such a fashion that we can stack them next to each other here. Um, various different designs from a point of view of where you place lamps and that sort of thing um, and I can go over all of that um, and basically just show you how these things are put together and more importantly the code that's involved in creating the logic behind this game. Now the main thing that makes all of this work is this target block from uh, Open Blocks. Um, quite simply you feed it a redstone signal and it emits a redstone pulse to say that uh, the target's been hit. So uh, on this basic demonstration here I've got a, a red lamp from the uh, Project Red Illumination mod pack at the bottom there, um, a stone block on the back and a lever. Flick the lever, puts out a signal through the block, um, the target picks up on that and pops up, obviously shoot the target and the redstone lamp pops underneath there and signifies that you've hit the target. So what we've got going on with each of these um, targets on here, they've all got the same sort of layout. Um, each target sits on top of um, this redneck cable, um, powered from behind with um, a block of whatever choosing. Um, typically I've got black here, uh, the idea being is so it can um, meld into the, um, into the background and so on when, from a player's point of view when you stood around the front here. Um, the targets haven't got any distracting blocks behind them to um, um, so you don't focus on on the wrong target so to speak um, again this is just sort of design lane design on that is however you decide to um, to do that um, but each of those is got its own color code um, so we've got in this instance green uh, which detects a pulse uh, orange on this one which enables the target uh, the one at the back here has got magenta on the back and pink on the bottom and we've got yellow on the back of that one to, um, sorry, white on the back of that one to uh, yellow on the bottom there to detect the hits. Um, and each of these lanes are all coded up exactly the same way. Um, so as you can see the colours through, through the lanes there, it's all exactly the same colours for each of the relevant target positions. Um, which also means actually when you're coding these things up it gets a lot easier to um, duplicate your code from each of the lanes across, e across each new lane that you add on. Um, so that, that's helpful on that front there. Um, we've also got a reset button on the front. Um, one thing I was finding typically is if you'd quit out of the game and come back in, um, on occasion there'd be no targets on any of the lanes popped up, uh, which was a bit weird. Um, it didn't really get to the bottom as to why that was. Um, but um, So decided to add a reset button into the, into the loop as well. Um, it also means as well that if you come back to a lane uh, and somebody's already got half a score on there or um, we're not starting from zero, um, you can quickly hit the reset button, it'll reset the lane, pick another target and reset the counter at the bottom there for you to start again from scratch. So pretty simple layout really. Um, again, design as you see fit. Um, the, the important part with this is how the programming logic all works with the redneck cable. Uh, and again, the actual layout of all this um, isn't that difficult to pick up on. Um, it's literally just from the front here, picking up the first lane, then jumping across where the next target's going to be, um, and then so on down to the back of the uh, back of the lane. Um, typically, I actually um, borrowed one of Pungence's ideas there for um, filling in the blanks with these uh, micro blocks, um, just so it looks as though, um, as he's got, um, each of these targets are on a, a sliding rail. Um, now obviously there's a bit of a gap there, but um, typically when you stood at the front of this, um, it's not so noticeable, so it um, seems to work out okay. Plus if you're hiding it with a bit of redstone lamps at the front here, um, then uh, again you don't really notice the fact that there's a bit of a gap, especially from this distance. Well, I'm just over here on lane 1 at the moment, just so I can show you the um, 7 segment display that we've got going on in the bottom of each of the lanes. Um, Lane 1 here is hooked up through, um, not only at the bottom of the lane, but also um, taking a feed out through the side, um, out to the back of these um, white lamps that we've got attached onto the front of the cable. 
Uh, and basically what we're using is something called a uh, seven segment encoder. Uh, now basically what that does is it takes the content of a variable, um, in this instance variable 10, um, and looks at the number that's contained within that variable and changes each of these A through G channels uh, or outputs on the right hand side here um, which are attached to the various seven segments on the um, display that you've got hooked up. So for example A is hooked up to white, B is to orange and so on through to G which is on the pink channel there. Um, and that's quite an important thing to remember is the order that you've got these and the order that you've got them set onto the back of the display that you're using. Um, so these are wired up exactly the same way. Um, uh, the, the version that I've got in the bottom of each of these lanes is slightly elongated. I don't know if you can see there that we've got three blocks on this first lane anyway. We've got three blocks um, to represent the vertical side of things. One block at the beginning, then there's two blocks in the middle. Um, three blocks at the end and then on this one just one block at the very top of the uh, of the digit there. Um, now the reason it's skewed is typically we're standing here and we're going to be looking at this at an angle. So when you're standing in front of something like that you get the full effect um, because you're effectively looking at all of the parts of the segment um, full on, um, it being in its vertical position. Um, obviously when it's lying down like that we can't, or you, if you've got all the, the uh, lanes co covered over there, you're not going to be able to stand in front of that and look at it full on. So it was an attempt to alter the aspect effectively that you're looking at. So um, it, instead of it looking squished towards the top, um, and we've got this a bit further on with some of the other lane designs here, um, is it looks more like a reasonable number. I mean this one's got three blocks towards the uh, top end there and right on the tip there's three blocks coming down to two three for each of the sides there and then the one at the bottom. Um, but again you can play around with the layout on that bit just to um, make it fit your design. Um, but the main thing with this is, um, as I say, is typically the seven segment encoder. If you do get any of the colours wrong on this you won't end up with the correct digits being displayed on the side there. So um, one thing to note when you're playing around with this is just set yourself up a simple counter. Um, basically it's along the lines of white along the top um, orange on the left hand side at the top, green on the right hand side at the top, pink is your middle channel, uh, with magenta on the um, left at the bottom and yellow on the right hand side at the bottom and blue along the very bottom segment. Um, now again be mindful with this and certainly when you're building upside down as you'll be go going through the lanes underneath um, you're looking at this from the back side or from the underside of the lane so um, just be careful of how you've got that configured there so you know take a note of the colors that we've got going on here I'll see if I can get everything all in screen um, because that's quite key as to um, the layout that you use actually within the encoder logic um, as I say if you get any of these in the wrong order you won't get the right digits coming out on the display Okay, I'm back over at the right hand side of the range now. Uh, I've got rid of that little demonstration piece, so um, I'll carry on and build or add another lane to this. Um, I'll speed through the video just so you can see roughly what's going on, and if I come across any important bits and pieces, I'll uh, point them out as we're going along. But uh, other than that, um, sit back and hopefully it won't take too long.
One thing you may notice when I've put these blocks here to uh, allow the power to transfer from the Rednet cable to the target, um, you can see on the back here there's not actually a connection been made. Now one of the features with this Rednet cable is you can actually turn off how um, it connects to any uh, nearby blocks. Um, typically it'll only make an automatic connection if it figures out that the block that it's next to will actually accept a redstone signal. Um, now obviously most blocks will accept a red nose, redstone signal but um, not all of them will do anything with it but what we're actually using this uh, birchwood block here for is just literally to pass the signal through from the uh, cable to the back of the uh, open blocks target. Um, now typically um, I did try and actually put the target directly to the back of the cable but um, you were getting problems whereby when the target was um, in the down position uh, there wasn't a connection point being made from the cable so it'd be okay if the target was actually up um, and you could actually specify a connection point but as soon as that target came back down again the um, the automatic uh, connect feature on the cable wouldn't figure out that it could connect again and subsequently the target had never popped back up so I had to work around that a little bit by sticking in a block um, as I say this block can be anything but um, just for clarity on this side of things I've uh, used this uh, birchwood plank here just to uh, show you what's going on now, if you can see there, we've got a hitbox that's come up behind that block. So if I take my crescent hammer here and right click on that, it changes the um, connection type. Now, the first one that we've got to here is forced connection mode. Now, again, that doesn't always work with the block here in the middle. So if we right click it again, it then drops it into strong connection mode. And that's what I've found to be the most reliable to um, push a signal into the uh, blocks behind the target. So um, I'll do that for the rest of the blocks and the other thing I'm going to quickly do is just make sure all my colour coding has been set um, on the same as the um, other lanes that I've got set up here. So this one's already in white uh, and I'll carry on and do the rest. Okay, one thing that you've probably also noticed is once we started putting these uh, iron blocks in here or the um, micro blocks that we've got going on, um, all of the cables suddenly figured out that A, I can make a connection. Um, looks a bit of an eyesore, plus we don't actually want it to make a redstone connection to, uh, to anything or a signal connection to anything. So, simplest way to go around that one, instead of hitting this connection block that we've got coming off the cable, if you actually use your crescent hammer to um, click on the cable section itself it'll take it into uh, cable only mode so effectively removing any connection points that are pop that, that's popped up um, with it trying to connect out. I mean this side's got both sides running on it because we've obviously got two sets of uh, imaginary runs running down the side of there so literally just clicking on the cable there is enough to uh, get rid of those connection points. Now the other thing to be mindful of here, um, because we've got these lanes um, as close as we can get them together, um, obviously we're bringing this uh, red net cable down the side here, or down from the top from each of the controllers. As you probably notice here, if I didn't have a block, what would actually happen as soon as I brought that controller down, or brought that cable down, um, it wanted to make a connection across there. And that would typically throw a problem then for all of the signal that you've got going on. So the way to get around that is to not actually have a uh, cable connection on this end point of the, um, of the flashing unit that we've got on the top there. If, if you get rid of that and just use a standard block, 
um, what that'll actually do is you can make the connection to it using the um, strong connection from the cable that you want to drive it from but on the other side we can get rid of that connection and tell it not to use anything on that side of the cable so the cable is coming down from its controller into its section on here and we've got a connection there I'll just put the last block in there and that connection will be made on there so now it's just simply a case of uh, copying all the colors and um, making sure everything matches up with that one. Okay, that's all the colours done. Um, typically if you're working at night, obviously make sure you've got enough illumination down here so you can see the colours. Um, but basically I've just copied um, the other lanes that I've got going on here. So the actual winning side of things that plays the music block and flashes the lights, they're done on the purple channel, um, which is reflected in all of this here. Um, and then we've got the uh, various coloured blocks that um, drive each of the segments on the display. Um, now again, this display is using the same as I already demonstrated on that uh, display on the outside. So if you want to pick the colour coding up from there, then please feel free to do so. Um, but again, it's just a duplication of, of whatever's in um, what was demonstrated on that first uh, example there. So we've got green, orange, white at the top, uh, pink in the middle there, um, yellow... Uh, magenta I think that color is there uh, and then blue on the tip there okay that's the basics of the lane built up there um, obviously we've got all the cabling underneath for the uh, display um, I've got each of these blocks coded up uh, and I've made a note of the colors on there uh, which from front to back is white orange and magenta uh, and just for a simple test, I'm just going to change the function of this button or the colour that this button's running on just to make sure that the targets are all popping up. So uh, around the back of the controller there, uh, if we cycle back through, the first one I want to test out is, oh, past it, is the white one. So hopefully that should, yep, first target goes up. Orange for the next one. Great. And magenta for the rear target. Great, so all that's working according to plan. Um, all we do, all this is doing here is basically this um, redneck cable is detecting the fact that I'm generating redstone on this uh, on this button here, and because they're all connected to the same channel, it's just echoing that down to uh, each of the targets that's got the relevant channels associated with the back of them. Um, so let me just change that back to um, purple for now. Oops, passed it. There we go. Uh, and that's a simple test on that one. Right, I was about to show you how to test the seven segment display and for the life of me I just set up a demonstration and couldn't figure out why the heck the thing wasn't counting or changing any of the display down there. Um, and this might actually be um, catch you out if you're building this. Um, and the one thing that I noticed, I'm just checking all my colours and that sort of thing, make sure that they were all okay and they're all connected. Um, but if we come back here to where the controller's connected to the uh, start of this red uh, net cable here. I don't know if you can see there that the actual top connection isn't made. So this top of the cable here has been put into cable mode only. So it hadn't made the connection to the controller. So right click on that with the crescent hammer and that adds that back in. Now one thing that you might notice um, and it's not happened on here is if it makes a connection to a block, you just need to cycle through those faces just to make sure that it's not connected.
So, uh, yeah, little gotcha that just had me there. So uh, one thing to watch out for when you're connecting this thing up, that you do actually have a connection to the bottom of the controller. OK, the actual test that I wanted to perform was to make sure that this um, seven segment display was all hooked up correctly. Um, now, the easiest way to do that is if we actually add in um, the seven segment decoder or encoder, sorry, um, into the um, controller here. Now, in this case, we're just doing it as a test, so I'm just going to leave the input value as a constant value at the minute of zero. Um, all of our outputs are on the downward face of the controller, so we need to go through and just make sure all of these um, are set to go down. And the order that I made a note of um, that I'm using all of these circuits goes like um, it goes for white, uh, orange, magenta, blue, yellow. Uh, green and pink. Interestingly, all in order, so it makes it easy for when you control uh, coding these things up. So that's set on zero at the minute. Um, oh, great, gone tonight. Um, and we can see there that the actual display is zero, so looking good so far. Go into that, up the value, got a one, up it again, got a two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now these will actually go up higher than ten. Um, so if we do a ten, what you end up with is an A. So any of you guys that are into programming out there will realise that that's the um, hexadecimal for ten. Um, and typically, if you go past that, then um, oops, eleven is going to be B. Um, lowercase b typically uh, and then so on through the rest of the uh, hexadecimal coding base there. Um, let me just reinitialize that just to get that out of the way. Set the time back today. And there we go. So that's the um, decoder that's set up correctly. Uh, don't worry the fact that this is being left on any values here because we've just taken the logic back out of there then that basically stays the, the last set of signals that were present on the cable so again not to worry in this point in time. Okay that's the basic framework built um, it's on to the programming side of things now with the controller. Um, now the actual controls for um, for the shooting targets take up uh, 10 slots out of the controller. Now at this point a basic controller only comes with six programming slots so that's effectively short as what we need for this. Um, now there's two ways that you can get there. Um, you can either use the uh, LX100 expansion uh, cards that you can build for this which um, as you can see from that give, there gives you uh, one circuit and eight variables. Um, or if you've got the materials for it I've been using the um, LX500 expansion car, uh, card which gives five circuits and 24 more variables. We're not heavy use on the variables at this point in time but we definitely need the circuits so um, for the thing that we're doing now that's the one I'm going to select and I'll just install that into the controller and there you see it fits into one of the slots there. Um, now typically this is a version that I did use in the LX100s and that's given me um, 11 programming slots. Um, the reason I've got 11, and I'll show you a second why, why that's the case, but um, although we only actually need 10, my original circuits that I designed were using the LX500 expansion slots, and one of the things that you can do with these things is there is a RPC memory card, and I strongly suggest that you get one of these crafted up. What that basically allows you to do is take the programming logic out of one controller and duplicate it into the next. So as long as you've got the available slots, um, you can take all of the circuit design or all of the logic out of the one and just duplicate it straight into the next one. Uh, and to do that, just have the controller card selected, right click and you can see there that the controller card has been updated from the controller. Move across to your new empty uh, controller and right click on that one and it loads up the program. Now typically it's decided that it's jumped the score to 2 for whatever reason um, but again this is why we've got a reset button. Hit the reset, that's reset that back to 0 and we've got a new target. So hopefully we can cycle through, test that it's all working okay, 
which it appears to be. Let's see if we can get to the end. Oops, hit the target, does help. And hopefully... There we go, we've got the flash impulses at the bottom there. So that's that. That's all coded up, um, and I'll just all that's needed now is to just run through the uh, programming logic. Hi there. Just thought I'd break out of the main video for the time being. Um, as I was putting this thing together, I noticed that we're well into sort of 45 minutes of a uh, video here, so we're getting a bit heavy, no doubt. Um, typically, it makes a bit of a logical choice to uh, break off here at the um, as we're starting to get into the logic of uh, programming these things. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, set that up on a second video, and uh, hopefully, it'll be next in the playlist. So, uh, I'll see you back there in a while. Um, other than that, again, comments and likes below if, if uh, appropriate, and I shall see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.